Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Life Gorgeous, where the exhale of positivity always starts off our show. This is where I share my magical life in hopes of improving your life. We have a return guest, one of my favorites. There are some people in my life that I like, Goldie, Gibby. It's fun to say their names. I don't like saying the sulk. It doesn't roll off like yeah, Goldie and Gibby. Not, but we bring way. in Alex Sulkin, ladies and gentlemen, from Family Guy, Alex Sulkin. <sighs> <laughs> a pleasure to be back. And, and you have to tell your fans because no one ever saw it, the the, the great hidden uh, Kilborn podcast episode. You had Goldie and I on for a test episode when you were just getting this started, and we literally could not get past the cleansing oh, exhale right, right, because it made right. me laugh so much yeah, we kept you, having to start again. I think you enjoy the exhale more than... Well, other people enjoy it. They just don't laugh as as uncontrollably as you do. I think it's one of the funniest things in the last 20 years of comedy. Thank you. If, yeah, I love it. I don't it. know if it's in the Martin Short category. Uh, no, I, That's tough. I can't believe. Tough to get there. I can't believe. I, don't, I, I just see headlines because I'm not going to, I don't, but somebody wrote a thing about Martin Short not being necessarily funny, which is so ridiculous because he's, he's a riot. Made me laugh more than probably anyone ever. Yeah, he's, he's he he's one of those guys who can walk across the the stage on SNL, and I would just be laughing. I believe it was Martin Short would go on Letterman and do some voices, and then he'd go, "Come on, Dave, do an impression, do an impression." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Letterman says, Dave. "I'm not talented. I can't do that." <laughs> uh, so I I want to jump into something of the writers' strike, but I yeah. something happened. I didn't know you you have a different beautiful tile background. Yes. Where are you? Are you? Because I know you have yes. a place. You used to have a place in LA. Then you live on like Cape Cod. Right. Where are you right now as we speak? Right now I'm in a little town, a little hamlet, we like to call it, uh, called Summerland. Ooh. Summerland, California, which is up in the Santa Barbara area, which I'm sure Lord Kilby is very familiar with. Yes. So I know all of those little nooks and crannies up there from Los Olivos to Solvang to Los Alamos to Carpinteria, mm. Teria. right near Summerland. Now, yep. Summerland, if I remember correctly, a lot of the homes are east of the 101 as opposed to west Oceanside. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. We're, we're east. Yes. We're east of it. Yeah. 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 We're up on a, up on a hillside here. Beautiful view. Beautiful view. Um, the air doesn't smell like oil and gas every day, <laughs> so you know we got that going. Right, and uh, it's a, it's the hardest eighty two miles of road to get from here to L A. Oh. Hardest eighty two miles of road in the world. Oh. so <laughs> how long did you look for the place? Uh, for a while. Yeah, uh, my wife is you know spearheads that operation, and she found this house and. I was told that it was fantastic. I came here to look, and it's beautiful. So we went ahead and pulled the trigger. And I, I ask because I've had two. Uh, I'm in a 1923 home, and I had a beautiful home in Ooh. the hills, the old Dennis Hopper house. That people, happy hundredth, yeah. happy hundredth. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's yeah. got po this has pocket doors. This is the mahogany panel den, etc. Yeah. But both houses, if you're sitting down, took me two and a half years to find. Wow. I loved, boy, that Hopper house was awesome. Oh, yeah. They've what written a, books about it. it, it they did, have. Did, did I tell you who owns it now or not? Did I tell you that or not? Uh, Martin Shkreli? Well, no, I don't know. No, no, no. Martin Lawrence Bullard, my old interior designer, the interior designer Ooh. to the stars. Yes. Wow. He fell in love so with the he, house. He's got and, good taste. Yeah. Um, he's done so. Martin, Martin Shkreli was the pharma bro who gouged everyone with the pharmacy prices. So okay. I, I, yeah, yes. Yeah. I don't um, I don't follow yeah. the pharmacy stuff. I know there. we are going to talk money, capitalism. You're the guy to talk to about yeah. that. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but one more question. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, two questions. What year is the house and what style is it? Mm -hmm. Those are both excellent questions. I have no idea on the year. Okay. Um, although it looks like it's pre-1940 you know, or 
Yeah, it looks like it's from the 30s okay. to me. Okay. And it's a, I would say, it's like a Spanish Moroccan style. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to guess. It looks beautiful. Yep. That's great. It's very nice. Well, congratulations nice. to you and yours. Thank you. Thank you. So this is actually, uh, this is going to air next Tuesday. This is the, uh, I've only, I already told John Viner, his is kind of an evergreen. It'll air in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. um, He's used to that. Yeah. And uh, I want to talk writer's strike. Uh, they're treading, uh, trending towards uh, s s settling this. Yeah. Uh, do you have overall thoughts on this writer's strike? Well, uh, I think it, uh, first of all, David Goodman, you should have him on your podcast. I know you don't know him personally. He used to run Family Guy, and then he was elected president of the WGA. Uh, a few years ago, he was in charge of that whole WGA strike against the agencies where we uh, stopped packaging. Um, and he's now just a member of the negotiating board. Okay. But- I, yes, go ahead. You have a question. I, I want to ask you about, I have it on my notes here, packaging. So packaging for the young people, uh, yeah. it was uh, like when I was at the Late Late Show, I had the same agent as Letterman, the big agency CAA, and they packaged it. So then I yep. wouldn't pay a commission, but they said it was uh, a conflict of interest because as long as they got their big chunk. And so that was a big fight a few years ago. And yes. one of the greatest pieces of literature ever written was David Simon from The Wire writing about packaging fees. <laughs> I don't know if you ever right. saw it. Do you ever read I that? I did. Okay. And and I don't like the F word, but he would say F bonnet and he would say F uh, he, uh, stick and it was very creative. But are you saying the packaging fees, I know they're, they've gone away. Have they fully gone away or not? Do you know? No idea. Okay. No yeah. idea. Yeah. I know. All, all, all I know is the headlines. And then when people say you can or can't do something, that's when I'm aware of it. Right. Um, in terms of this strike, obviously, I think the big thing that we're fighting for is uh, streaming residuals. Mm -hmm. And that's a big deal, especially for Family Guy writers, because Family Guy gets a lot of streaming traffic. And uh, it would be nice to work out a more equitable solution. I'll give you an example. Uh, I don't know if you have Netflix. Most people do. Yes, sir. Uh, for for a while recently, Netflix was really pushing that show Suits. Yeah. Like Suits, Suits was a show that existed, you know, maybe 10, 15 mm -hmm. years ago. And it was a fine show and did pretty well and had several seasons, but wasn't really like a giant hit. Right. So then Netflix acquires Suits and they start pushing it. They They had it when you opened Netflix. It was the first thing that they recommended. And so uh, recently it was revealed that over 3 billion minutes of Suits had been watched on Netflix because they, they mm -hmm. pushed it up front. And do you know how much the entire writing staff got in streaming residuals for 3 billion minutes over the entire writing staff? So we're talking probably a dozen people. $125. <laughs> you asshole. You kidding. guessed intentionally <laughs> low. Well, now my guess is going to, now my answer no. is going to sound high. No, it was $3,000. Oh my gosh. So for that 3 billion minutes, $3,000 wow. was spread over, you know, a dozen people. So that's nothing. So I think that's the biggest issue that the Writers Guild is really looking into. I think there are a lot of other issues that are on right. the table, but I think that's the biggest one. And, and I don't know if you saw, um, I think it was Judd Apatow described it as, um, Major League Baseball player, he's they don't show their averages. They don't show their batting average. So yeah. they and all the guys are paid minimum wage. All, all the <laughs> right. players, everyone's paid the same. So uh yeah, you have to, and, and I guess they're working on that now where they're they're finally gonna let people know what uh, what shows are are streaming at a high rate. Yes. It's funny you mentioned suits because I mean, I he I've heard of it, but in the last two months, I've heard two friends say, hey, I was watching Suits the other day. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, it's supposed to take place here, but they shoot it up in Canada. I go, why is everyone talking about Suits? I mean, don't you guys know <laughs> well, Three Days of the Condor is on Prime Video? I mean, what is going yeah. on? <laughs> oh, I love that movie. Let's not get started. That's the best hair ever in movies, I think, is Redford's hair in that movie. I just... Unbelievable. Some of the movies, you know... The, like I watch Bullet Steve McQueen, but the pacing is, is a little slow. It's up in San Francisco, yeah. but the pacing for Three Days of the Condor is right away. He's going out to get the lunch, the sack lunch, and then he everyone's comes dead. back, and everyone's been obliterated, and the movie is is propelled. 
I just and love also it. you get you get Cliff Robertson's just a plus toupee. His hair oh. was so thick. I love when he fake. sat down. He was great with the pastrami and, and <laughs> Faye Dunaway. Take that with you. Let's go. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, my yeah. god, it was great. Um, uh, but but back to suits. Uh, suits kind of makes me chuckle because I'm in the same boat as you. I've never watched it, but now people are talking about right. it. And the lead actor in it. Do you know his name? No. Okay, so it's it's Gabriel Macht, M A C H T, and I laugh whenever I see his name because of you. I picture him as like a second guest on a late late show where you'd have to say, "Oh, we got him, Gabriel Macht." We had so many great second guests. By so the way, many. what's the name of that actor uh, who who was in? Um, I think he was on one of the CSIs or whatever. But he's then he was on that show called Bull. On CBS, he was a CBS actor. You know who I'm talking oh, the, about? The lead guy, yeah. the lead guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I don't remember his name. He got in a little hot water yeah. a few years ago, but I don't remember his name. Okay, so I, I could look it up, but he he told a story. You know, he's just a normal guest, but he he had a sense of humor, and yeah. um, he said uh, on the show, he goes, "Yeah, I've stopped drinking for a month, Craig. I've stopped drinking for a month." And I said, "How does that yeah. going?" Well, this is how it goes. Okay, it's 6 p.m. <laughs> now it's uh, 6.05. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He was like, Counting there, the there's, minutes. Nothing, there's nothing yeah. going on here. Nothing uh, to do when the sun goes down. Um, I'll just quickly tell you his name. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, he yelled at Eliza Dushku. I always liked saying her name. We had her on, by the way. Oh, Dushku. Um, Michael Weatherly. Anywho, there it is. So I'm going to go back to the strike. Yeah, Gord, uh, Alec Gordon. Life, we're, Gordon we're, we're both creative forces in in <laughs> you know, and we're not kind of. I you. don't know if you're a business person. I mean, you don't even know what year the house was built, but that's okay. No, but no. Uh, Gordon Gecko once yeah. said, "Greed is good." Well, we've got mm -hmm. some greed going on. Uh, I, I, he's a fictional character. I don't think greed sure. is good, but it people are motivated. There's so many questions. Are you, are you turned off by, are you turned off by the greed in Hollywood or is it part of the process where, Hey, we have the strikes and it all works out. Yeah. I kind of th think the latter, I do believe that it's part of the process and I do, you know, as, as you know, yes, Gordon Gecko is a fictional character, but I think there's a kernel of truth in what he said. And especially in terms of, uh, America and capitalism. And I do believe that a lot of the greatest progress uh, forward and in innovation and and uh, and all that comes from from greed. And I think that it's not the greatest instinct, but I think that it keeps the wheels of America turning in in a way. And and also, I believe in Hollywood. You know, this people characterize the the studios as as greedy, and I think that that's possibly true but also you know we signed on to be writers or actors and we knew going right. in that we work at the pleasure of these people who pay us right so there's an interesting uh dynamic there but i do think these strikes are good in that they they raise the level of fairness you know yes. up to an acceptable level totally agree and yeah. I also think some people, some of the creatives, and this will be a little funny, but some of us have a different view on money. We're not as intoxicated. If I yeah. was a short, fleshy guy, I don't think I could say fat anymore. If I was a I mean, short, yeah. fleshy guy, bald, I might be more fascinated with money. But I know, does Bob Iger know James Spader wins? Does he know that James Spader wins in certain categories or not? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. The Iger has come off, I think, a, a kind of poorly in this whole strike. And he's I don't think a, he's a bad guy, by the way. I, no, no, and we we have to say that legally. But yes, I don't think he's a bad guy either. I think you know he's in charge of me. He's in, right. at the head of the company that I work for, and right. I think he's very respected at what he does, and he's clearly great at it. I mean, he went, he retired, and they said, "No, don't retire. Come right. back and run Hollywood." And he, yep. 
I just think that he got caught off guard with a couple of comments um, at the beginning of the strike that didn't look great because he was sort of on the deck of a yacht or at some exclusive, uh, you know, uh, hideaway in in Idaho with other billionaires. And it it just didn't look great for him. You know, we're not going to get into this, but years ago, I'm saying maybe 30 years ago or even longer, a conservative acquaintance of mine said that CEO pay is now out of control and obscene. And this was back 30 years ago. Yeah. And he explained it to me. He said, some Ivy leaguer went to these CEOs and says, here's how you guys can do this and make, you know, you don't make five times as much or six times you make 250 times as much. Yeah. And so it definitely is out of control. And I have all, I have a myriad of thoughts on, on, on that stuff, but we don't have to get into it uh, uh, today. I'm I did just wanna, glad you said myriad. Yeah, I just want to. I, I want to give you a couple more little things I like to say about f- finances. So sure. um, there, there's a uh, again. I'm not always impressed with wealth. Uh, there's a Hollywood weasel I know who has a very nice home, and they say yeah, he has a really me? nice home. What's that? Is that me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't consider you a Hollywood weasel. Okay, but this guy is, uh, you know, one of the, and I, I always want to tell people, I don't care because every time he goes into, you know, his, his den, he's still a weasel. Or if he takes a steam shower in bathroom number four, he's still a weasel. So I'm not that right. impressed. Yep. And the other money thing is I remember a few years ago, um, you know, we were, the Vikes were over, the Minnesota Vikings were overpaying Kirk Cousins. He's a top 15 quarterback, but he was paid top five. Yeah, and he's a you know he's a Christian you know family man, and I I just said to somebody if they had a reality show on the weekend of him going out and spending a million dollars or Baker Mayfield, I would much rather watch Baker Mayfield go on yeah. a reality show and spend a million bucks. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? Well, they did a reality show with Kirk now where we got to watch him, his wife spend not a million, but probably a couple hundred on like J. Crew uh, shirts. <laughs> did you watch that? Did you watch any of that on yeah, Netflix? I or did. That? I actually uh, fast forwarded to just his parts because I don't watch yeah. a lot of sports documentaries. I watch too much live sports, but I yeah. watched him. I thought he came across great. Everyone did. He took a lot of hits. He mm-hmm. is, he is, he's tough. He's just a little, his frame is not as sturdy as a Peyton Manning or a Tom Brady. So he, he sometimes will get a strip sack a little easier, but, but he came across well, what I liked, what jumped out at me was, uh, and I said this on another podcast, but uh, it was, uh, they lose at home. They get killed by, to the Cowboys. It's Thanksgiving week. They get killed at home, 40 to nothing or 40 to three. And they have a game Thursday against your Pats, which we won on Thanksgiving day. But during yeah. the week, he had a commitment where he had to hand out a Thanksgiving dinner. And he was in the moment so earnest. His job was the green beans. Do you want green beans with that? Hi, I'm Kirk. Would you like green beans? Hi, <laughs> Kirk. And he I was like, I'm like taking my green beans. This guy is so, <laughs> he's got all this stuff on his mind and he's focused. Yeah. What do you think of that? You know? Well, I mean, he does seem like a genuinely nice, sweet man. Right. He's like a little too into the Lord for me, mm-hmm. but it has resulted in him being a very kind person. Right. And you're right. He comes off very well in well, that documentary. If, if, if he said, if I met him and he's, you know, I, I said, I know Jesus is your co-pilot. Mine's Larry Bird. What would he <laughs> think about that? He would laugh. He would laugh because that's a great line. And also let's ride with Larry. Come on. Um, um, oh, handsome alert. So yeah. we should point out to the people <clears throat> that Alec is a, a bit of a snob uh, w- because he made a chunk of change on uh, the uh, the the profane teddy bear movies the the f bomb yes. dropping teddy bear yeah. Ted one and two so i wanted to ask you when you did the fir- you guys didn't know the first one was going to do that well you no. had a standard deal i assume on the first one you had a standard deal yes did did that you don't have to answer any of these questions did that include a back end on the standard deal or not no, no, not on the first one. That the the one that we would have really wanted a back end on, we did not have any points on, which was the first head. I mean, Seth did, and he right. did great, and he deserved it. Right. Um. But he was giving uh, Wells and I a break to to write with him on that that movie. So we just got like a regular deal, which was you know fine. It was good. 
Yeah. But the second one, right. we got much more profit sharing, which of course didn't result in as much because the second one did not do as well as the first one. Right. So my question, two questions, <clears throat> because the first one did so well, did you get a bonus? No. Okay. The bonus, the bonus was a better deal on the second. Okay. One. Okay. So I it understand. was like, we had, we had the opportunity to cash in on that. Uh, but then Seth insisted on a 15 minute court scene in the middle, which really dragged things down. <laughs> <laughs> and then I guess the other question is, I hear stories where, you know, the, we're now we're going to be talking about Ted too, but the second movie, then do you audit do you, you know, you heard about auditing you, to get all yep. your money, you got to audit yeah. them. It's just a normal process. Yeah. Is that, I know. Well, this, this, I have a lot to, I mean, not a lot, but I have something to say about this because I feel like as we were talking before about greed and the, the corporations and all that, an unfortunate part of Hollywood is that it's just accepted practice that the studios are going to in some way, screw you out of some money. Bingo. And then it creates another industry, which is this auditing industry, because then you have to go to them and pay them totally. to go look at the books. So it's like they, the auditing, auditing industry doesn't care. They're happy that the studios are exactly. screwing us because then they get to work and make money. Well, you're so helping you know, the we, economy. Yes. I know this money flows back and forth. And then they're like, oh, you were right. Here's an extra $11,000. You know, it's, it's always oh. the same way. And I've said this since the beginning and and weirdly not with CBS, not with your show. When I was working there, I never had a problem in terms of like what I was getting paid versus right. what I was expecting to be paid. But once I went over to Fox, um, which I generally have a great relationship with the people who work there, but there were many times along the way where the payment was off and they would always go, oops, you're right. Here you go. And then there's a very secret thing that a lot of writers don't even know, which is that when you uh, get a contract to work uh, anywhere, you get, you don't get 10% of your money until you physically sign the contract and hand it to them. So even though your agents are like, okay, done deal. We finished it. It's all done. You have to physically get your hands on a contract. Give it a, this is my least favorite term that I've been hearing a lot lately, a wet signature. <laughs> they need a wet signature. Oh my gosh. And then you get this 10% that they were secretly holding. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, it was very... more innocent at the CBS Late Late Show. You were paid yeah. fairly. I'm sure mm -hmm. it also... You were happy because the host would take you to Dupars on occasion. Oh, Dupars. Well, no, I mean, I was happy because A, it was my first ever professional writing job. Thank you again. I have a funny story about that. We got him. Um, we got him. We, oh, we got him. This guy we never heard of. Um, but Jason it was, Zubach. <laughs> oh, geez, that's right. Long ball, long drive champion, Jeremy Zubach. Jeremy. We got him. That was great. And, uh, but no, and also it was that thing that, you know, when you're 25 and you finally start getting paid to write, you're, you're shocked and thrilled at the end of each week when a paycheck comes and it's over a thousand dollars. And I'm like, oh my God, I've made it. Yeah. Hollywood in general, I mean, pays well, let's be honest. It does. It pays well. It does. If you, it, then, but if there's you, a, there's a, obviously a disparity that throws people off and then, then, then you have to, you know. Yep. I have a I have a little uh, sidetrack story here. So, Goldie, who you mentioned up top, good friend of mine, we do a podcast together. Oh you yes, nice enough the, to be a very, guest on that. A typical disgusting display. You get great That's guests. It. You've had Mila Wait, Kunis like you. on. You've had uh, uh, John Mulaney on, I believe. Yes, wow. John Mulaney, yeah. Kilby, and so we. I went out to dinner with Goldie last week and Viner. And uh, what was the location? We went, was it Jar? We, we went to Jar. Oh wow! You knew it. You, you like you the carpet it. there? I love the carpet. I love it. I love it. It's like a like an old person's country club. Yeah. I just love it there. So we get there, and Goldie insists that we have dinner early all the time. So we we're we're getting there at six thirty, and as we're I, I, I'm at the bar already. Goldie comes in, and he comes in at the same time as Conan O'Brien, oh. who was coming to have dinner there, and so. On the podcast the next week, we talked. Goldie and I talked about our dinner, and he mentioned that you know he arrived at the same time as Conan O'Brien, and that that Conan actually held the door for him when he came in. And so I jumped in after that. I said, 
that's the first time Conan's held a door open for you. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went on to praise you. Did did Con did Conan know who Goldie was or not? Well, no, and Goldie was very funny about this because Goldie was an uh, an intern on that show. You know, he oh, he worked right. there to right. towards the beginning, yeah. and uh, so Goldie was was saying how proud of himself he was. He said because I didn't go up to Conan O'Brien and say, "Hey, remember me?" Right. And he said because I know if somebody looks at a bald skeleton like me and says, hey, I used to work for you, they're going to think I'm almost dead. Oh, that's funny. That is so funny. Um, uh, what was you? So many thoughts there. Okay, so we did the, the writer strike and then the uh, SAG strike will probably will be next to solve that problem. I yep. don't know. Do you know, is, is it kind of the same thing with the streamers, with the actors? Is that correct? I th I believe so. I think that's kind of what everybody and 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 the actors are fighting the AI issue as are the writers, but I think the actors have a you know more immediate threat from AI because I guess now sometimes an actor can come in for one day of extra work, they can scan their likeness and put them in the background as an extra for right. the end of time until the end of time and they only have to pay them for that one day. Right. By the way, I, I swear to God, um, I was at I was in Minneapolis for a week uh, a little while ago. I saw I was uh, I was watching you on Instagram. I and saw. I had I had a, a dinner with my friend Charlie, and Charlie uh, we has a friend who's now a friend of mine, and um, uh, Tim, and uh, and then we were with Minnesota Timberwolves head coach Chris Finch, which is very oh. a delight for me. Finch, and I somehow. I don't know why, you know, they, they sometimes ask Hollywood questions or, and I say, yeah, I have some writer friends. They write for family guy, you know, uh, Alex Sulkin. Oh, he's the, that's the guy that did Ted, right? Oh, I got I'd love to meet him sometime. <laughs> I don't fin know. Finchy? I don't know if it was Finchy or the guy or the, the other guy. All right, well, that's important. Yeah. I, I, I but I was like, well, how do you guys know? You mean Mike Grayson? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it's, it, but it was interesting. But I do know we should tell people you do the typical discussing display. You have Family Guy and you have an incredibly popular Twitter account. I do, although, you know, Twitter has become X. something different. It has become X and it's become kind of a, a wasteland of people shouting at each other about politics, mm -hmm. which I don't like at all. Um, so my Twitter engagement, uh, has decreased significantly over the past couple of years. Yeah. Although I still, I still look back on the whole experience fondly. Yeah. That's my big, uh, <clears throat> criticism of society is we're too patient with the malcontents and we've given them a voice with, uh, with yeah. X, with Twitter X and whatever. Um, yep. one more thing before we move on, you mentioned, and it, it is, it is one of those things that makes me roll my eyes or get frustrated that it's a given, you know, that Hollywood is going to, uh, I don't want, I don't yeah. want to say cook the books, but what, what is the expression? Yes. No, that's, that's it. That's the expression. That's it. And, yeah. and for the people out there, the one I heard 25 years ago is like, they'll, they'll do a movie and they'll have, a, so they'll do Ted with Alex Sulkin and these guys, and they'll have a meeting in the conference room and they'll say, you guys, you want some bottled water. And then when the expense is the bottled water, each of the little things is a hundred dollars. So yeah. they overcharge all their expenditures and all this kind right. of crap. But I, it also reminds me, it bothers me when people say government waste is an inevitable, you know, because you want, you want the wealthy tax the, properly and that's subjective, but you also want the government to be as efficient as possible. And I think you probably yeah. heard the story about, you know, they wanted to put a public bathroom up in San Francisco and it, and it was going to cost like a million dollars for one little toilet. Did you ever hear that yes, story? Yes, I remember that. And then yeah. the company said, we'll put it in for free. We'll just put yes. it in. And then the, <laughs> and the guys go, well, we have some people that we pay, some government officials that have to check out what you're doing. So it's yeah. still going to cost a million dollars. They're, they're lining up at the trough of government spending. Oh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, there it is. Why can't it just be innocent where... John Havlicek has to get a job in the summer. He plays for the Celtics during the season and you have three networks and, you know, yes. and Howard Cosell is dominating and that's it. I love it. You get Tommy Heinsohn's hometown call of the team. Uh, I, I, take me back to the CBS basketball era. Oh, wait a second. Okay. Let me, let me hit you with a couple uh, Patriot things here. What do oh, you want do. Now, for the, 
people at home, uh, Alex Sulkin is probably the biggest Tom Brady fan in America, more so One than up. Irina Sh- Shake, Shake, Shake. Yeah, whatever her name is. Yeah. Uh, Bradley Cooper's ex wife. But uh, <laughs> you love Tom Brady. What do you want do. him to do now in retirement? Because he has options. Well, I believe he's signed on to be a Fox uh, broadcaster next year. Okay. I think he sort of was like, I'm taking this year off, and then next year I can come back to to uh, Fox. But I, all I want to see him do is just parade around <laughs> like a former president and get free food anywhere he goes to in New England, free beers, right. free dinners. I, I want him to be treated like the royalty that that he is and i don't want him to embarrass himself okay okay yeah and how would that be you mean being public yeah, intoxication I, I, or what well that even that is fine he did that at that yep. to the tampa bay super bowl yep. parade which i thought was actually a, a good human moment for him what i'm talking about is i don't want him to run as a Republican senator. Okay. You know, be like, I don't want that. I'm glad I asked the follow-up. Let's be specific. Yeah. yeah. No, it's great interviewing skills. You always have the most natural host in late night. <laughs> <laughs> um, although he could help, you know, bring that party back to the Mitt Romney era. <laughs> well, I, listen. Because <laughs> Mitt no, no, Romney, no, I, at least, I, I agree I did, with that. by the way, Ben Stiller did a thing. He, he, he on, on Threads or X, he, he said, I don't agree with his politics, but congratulations in retirement to Senator Romney, blah, blah, blah. Yep. And then he got, how can you agree with blah, blah? And everyone is ripping <laughs> him for saying, saying something about I respectfully uh, disagree. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, I totally understand what he was saying, by the way. I, and I've had that thought many times as I'm sure, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a card carrying Democrat as many people in Hollywood are, but I don't, I try not to be obnoxious about it or in your face about it. Um, but I'm, I never thought I would be at a place where I would miss George W. Bush. Yeah. You know, I never thought I would be in a place where I would yearn right. for Ronald Reagan. Right. You know, and and yet I I do. I miss the veneer of civility <laughs> exactly. in in politics. Uh, you yeah. know, even if even if they were doing nasty things behind the scenes, if they're out front and they're being respectful and they're speaking well, like I'm uh, let let politics do it work its magic but it's just now that has been torn away i know it, it's ugly and the the ugly americans are coming out and yeah. i i have said that i'm as you know gliding above the political fray and independent happened yep. to i always say i like uh, my favorite politician is is barack obama but obviously i i like churchill because of my leadership skills but i've also said as much as i like barack obama i like his temperament I have the proper admiration for Mitt Romney. I don't yeah. relate to Mormonism, but that's okay. But yeah. this is what I said. I don't know if I ever told you this. When Barack Obama came on the scene, I said, wow, this guy is impressive. And then I said, I think really impressive conservatives, they don't go into politics. They go into business because yes. I'm not that impressed, except for like a Mitt Romney. Most of the guys, I wasn't impressed with George W. Bush. I just wasn't impressed with a lot of these guys. So. no. Well, and like Mitt Romney and like a John McCain, for yeah. sure. Yeah. You know, you get people out there who can, who's, uh, you, I'll never forget when McCain was running against Obama. You, and remember that famous yeah. sort of town hall yeah. he hosted where a woman got up and started saying these things about Obama that were lies. And he stopped her and corrected her, yeah. which I thought was incredibly gentlemanly. Right. And that is totally gone in politics now. And we don't, and of course, I always like to tell you, I never trusted Trump. He's a lifelong Democrat. Anywho, yeah. joking, <laughs> joking. I love it, love it. Um, let me go to a little comedy here. Um, sure. <laughs> I did you. Joke, I did send you an email saying, I'm going to ask you why you enjoy people falling down. So Alec yeah. is a very funny guy, very clever. He does a lot of wordplay, maybe too many puns for his wife to handle, but that's okay. Yeah, way too many. Way too but, many. But he also was one of those guys where I feel for someone with they trip and fall. You, right. were, you were really enjoying it. Why is that? I don't, you know, it's, uh, listen, ask me and most of the world. I mean, we, people enjoy pratfalls. Slipping on a banana is pretty much, banana peels, like the oldest, one of the oldest forms of comedy. And you mentioned specifically, which I loved, the uh, Kelsey Grammer falling off stage in that one man yeah, show. I felt bad for him. I, I'm, I'm, boy. Yeah. 
I well, I, listen. I love uh, Frasier, one of the greatest characters in television history, certainly in comedy for sure. And so I love him for that. He's like, you know, it's like when you watch an athlete that you love, but you, you they're an asshole off the field. You put put that aside. Yeah, I just to let you know, I I interviewed Kelsey Grammer. Seems like a nice enough guy, but I really separate him from the character because I love the character so much. And I, and as he says, he's not as interesting as that character. He's not, he's not like a, you know, some of the comedians like Larry David is Larry David. I mean, he's just very funny that way. Uh, but so you like people that fall down. I'm con- Yeah. I'm concerned that they get hurt, but um, yeah, that's okay. What, what about, I wanted to ask you, cause everyone loves Bill Burr and I get a kick that he, uh, and I do too, I, although I'm yeah. not as, well versed as I should be, but I've watched a few of his specials. He's he's above cancel culture, and I get I, I love I, that. I, I find he's immune to it, and I and I agree with you. And why is that? Why do you love that? And why is he that way? Well, it's interesting, I, and and you could say the same thing about uh, Family Guy, which maybe you're not as passionate about, but we are in the same in the same kind of category where. People just expect a certain style of humor from us, and they know that it's going to be offensive. Mm-hmm. And I think Bill, it, it's the same way with Bill Burr. Like he was able to rise to fame before "quote unquote" cancel culture had taken hold, and he established, uh, you know, a large fan base. So they come to expect him to say controversial things about men and women, about race relations, and. Also, having that Boston thing, yeah, uh, it, it really because he seems like he's a guy carrying a lunch pail. Mm-hmm. He seems like he's a blue collar, like hardworking guy, and I think he gets away with a lot because of that. So, if he's wearing an ascot, he wouldn't get away with it. Nah, no. If he was wearing held- Lord Kilby's outfit in a mahogany den and saying those things, he would not get away with it. I'm held to a higher standard. America. You are. <laughs> uh, no, and and you. Uh, he also what he also does. He makes sense with his arguments. I love that. He'll he'll yes. he'll point out the hypocrisy and he's not being offensive to be offensive. He's saying this is okay to say, this is why it's okay to say and this is okay to think this way and that's what I love. Yes. Well, and also one of his most unbelievable breathtaking bits that it, it's it's shocking that this has not gotten him canceled, but it is very funny. He has a whole bit that you can, you know, see on YouTube where he's talking about watching a, a some Oprah style talk show with his wife and they had another guest on talking about domestic violence and he's like for the thousandth time like we really need to hear about it again and he said and he imitates a woman's voice he said and the most important thing is there is no reason to hit a woman and he goes really he goes, because I can think of about 20 off the top of my head. He goes, you just don't do it. Right. <laughs> like, it was, it's so shocking oh. to say that phrase, but I was laughing so hard. So that's the key with Bill Burr, too, is you have to be very funny, and the funniness covers up. Right. Like it helps, you know, it's the spoonful of sugar that helps that tough medicine go down. That I have not seen that bit, but oh. I've heard about the bit. From a woman so, who said it was hysterical. So it's, right, good. There yes. we go. I, I can't. I, I am going to find it. I'm going to find that. Yeah. You know the other thing. Or going back to the uh, some of the inappropriate stuff because you were saying you guys still do jokes on Family Guy. I'm curious as to what they are. I guess I could obviously watch and figure it out. That's but, okay. We but, don't. It's for young boys. Um, but um, you know, I stopped doing. Uh, you're, we're not supposed to do fat shaming, and we, we were yeah. doing. We were doing fat jokes on, uh, sure, on the uh, on the late late show. So and the so and so the the, the plump. Uh, there were, I'm not going to say her name, but a plump uh, celebrity has a new perfume, and it's yeah. regular and creamy ranch. And these were the uh, Ross Abra specials. But anywho, oh, great. But then I was thinking, um, what is it psychologically? We do like um, when you say we like Pratt Falls. Yeah. So you have Kevin James who makes fun of his weight. Obviously, yep. John Candy, Jackie Gleason. There's something about it. But even when we see a little toddler who's a little chubby and he falls, we start giggling. Yes. So there's something. I know you're yeah. talking about falling, but there's something about chubby is charming or chubby is cutie or cutesy or yeah. something. So I don't know. 
Yeah, no, I agree with you. And and it's it's interesting. I mean, God bless somebody like Kevin James for embracing it and making fun of it because he understands that that's a that's a big reason, no pun intended, that he became popular in the first place. It's like if he was just a skinny guy, him playing yeah. that character on King of Queens, it wouldn't have been as interesting, yeah. but it, it is interesting because he is this sort of hefty guy and he could make fun of himself and a lot of the jokes on the show come out of what he looks like. And I think he's just, you know, it's just being realistic. And now the, I think the important thing now that we're learning, and I agree with this, is that it's better, I think, if it emanates from the person themselves. Right. I think when we right. when we go, like the, the joke that you mentioned by Ross Abrash, which was very funny, and I remember it, um, I think now you would kind of hesitate to make that kind of a joke. I don't think you'd do but, it anymore, yeah. Right. But I do enjoy that when people are heavier and they, they play that for comedy themselves, like a uh, Chris Farley used to, or yeah. Kevin James, you know, it's it, that, that really hits home. And, and, and I think is, a, is still a good thing. There was also a thing where some of the heavier guys like Gleason, sometimes they would do a quick, a little dance. They were nimble. Yes. And it was like when we watched Charles Barkley, who could Jumped to the moon, even though he was the mound round, yeah, mound round. Of, what was he? Mound round, round, re, round, round mound, mound of, of rebound. rebound. Yeah, circumference. Yeah. So, what kind of controversial jokes? I, again, I could do my research and actually watch Family Guy, but uh, enough people are watching that the show's going to yeah. go on. You're going to pass away, and it's still going to be on. By the way, I boy, I hope so. I mean, I hope so. How many years yeah, has nope. it been on? Do you know? It it has been on since 1999. Wow. So late 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 show yeah. launch, yeah. seamless launch in late night, most seamless launch in animation. Same year, wow. there was something in the air. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's been on for a long time. We're we're in season 22, um, and uh, yeah, we, we still do very offensive things every week. And we have battles with, yeah, go ahead. Greg. Well, I was going to say, is there, are they sex jokes? Are they physical deformity jokes, physical appearance jokes? What all, kind of, all. all of them? Yeah. All. Yeah. We, we, we try to do all of them and we do sex, ethnicity, physical appearance, you know, dumb and smart, um, gay, we, oh, wow. we we still play Stewie the baby as you know is he gay isn't he so we get a lot of mileage out of, of those kind of jokes and we try to you know move with the times so I'll give you an example which encompasses my word play and something offensive so you know there's been a lot of, made over the last few years about pronouns people's pronouns and it's a you know it's an issue that some people feel passionately about and others feel like is ridiculous mm -hmm. so we had Stewie the baby was at a birthday party with a, a new kid in town and they were at a bowling birthday party. So they're, they're talking shit to each other as they're about to bowl. And Stewie, uh, he's got his ball ready and he says, uh, he goes, um, what are your pronouns? Um, I bet they're they, them because you ain't she it. <laughs> And like, for me, that was like a threading a needle of wordplay and oh. pronouns and all that. But, but the, uh, standards said no oh. to that. Even though, like, I feel like jokes that are perfectly worded yeah. should be rewarded yeah. and that makes sense, but they said no, 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 no. They don't want to wade into that. And I, I was going to ask if it's incredibly frustrating, but you're probably used to it because you do so many shows, so you just move on when they say no? That one for me was more frustrating than others just because A, I pitched it, so I'm like more attached to it. Right. But B, I was... I was wanted to say like no this is this is worded correctly like he, the way that he is saying it is perfect he's not saying shit he's right. saying she it and he's making fun of these pronouns and all that kind of stuff they they wouldn't go for it but yes some stand out as as you know more frustrating than others uh over time i'll give you another example uh many years ago we did a bit where peter the father is in the war in Iraq and he's getting his marching orders from his sergeant. The sergeant is telling all the men like what they're going to do. They're saying, okay, men, 
We're going to go, you know, storm that bunker and we're going to clear the enemy out of there. And all Peter kept saying was, okay, got it. So we go, we shoot Pat Tillman in the head. And then we, and then the guy's saying, no, 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 no. Nobody said shoot Pat Tillman. We got to go in there and clear out that bunker. He said, no, got it. Shoot Pat Tillman in the head. We take the bunker and they're saying, no, 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 no. Nobody shoot Pat Tillman. And then the, the end of the gag is like a lot of just gunfire and screaming. So obviously it didn't make it to air. But it was animated. It made it sort of a little, you know, far along in the process. Somehow, this bit got to Pat Tillman's brothers. Wow. And Pat Tillman's brothers reached out to Seth MacFarlane to tell him how much they enjoyed the oh, joke. Oh, wow. Saying like, that's you crazy. know, because they were all on about exposing the fact that that's what happened, that, that our own forces accidentally killed him and the U.S. was trying to cover that up. Wow. So they were all in favor of that bit. That's, is that a common story? Do people know that story? I, I, it's been told before, but I, I don't know that it ever really got enough traction because I think it's a story that people don't really want to hear. Well, no one will hear it now because it's just a life gorgeous, which is kind of a private club. It's an exclu- <laughs> ours is an exclusive club. Oh, the, the oh life please, gorgeous. no, it's a lot less private than our podcast. I'll um, tell you that much. I just try to be self deprecating once in a while. I just, it's just so foreign to my DNA. I know it exhausts you, and you shouldn't be. When you look like you, don't be self deprecating. It um, comes off as false. Keep in mind, I drink. Keep in mind, I drink. People, I know it. This I know a- the skin is unbelievable. <sighs> I don't understand it. Again, it's so funny that I'm, you're my buddy and I'm asking you about yeah. your show. That I've, I remember years ago you said, watch it. I watched, I go, wow, joke, joke, joke. And they can, yeah. so much freedom because I always give the example. That's like Christopher Columbus. And then they show Christopher Columbus on the Santa Maria or something. Like you can yeah. show, you know, it's not that costly yeah. to, to, right. <laughs> to go to the moon or exactly. anywhere. Yeah. So it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant show, but it's funny that I'm asking my friend what's on it because I, again, I, I'm that's a little, not funny. It's, it's a common experience I have. It de- believe me, and and I wouldn't expect uh, a lot of people of our age to be like diving in to watch that. It's something that the, as you say, the young people love it. They're they're grooving on it. I took you to a, a Wolves Laker game. You didn't know that slow mo was a good ball player. You were thrown <laughs> off when he would drive and kick, and you go, "Oh, he's not confident to shoot. He's throwing it a little outside." So I, anyway, slow mo. Um, so. Uh. Um, do you do celebrity jokes is what I wanted to ask you. I'm sure you do. Yeah. Yeah. We trouble? have them all the time. Sometimes. Yeah. We've, we, um, there was, uh, a time, uh, a while ago we had this great joke about, uh, Shatner. Yeah. So we had, a, it was again, Peter, the father at a Star Trek convention asking a question, uh, of Shatner who was up on the stage. And the question was, in that episode where you killed your wife, how come you were so fat? <laughs> and so then we get, which oh. is a double, double, double death yeah. sentence. One of them is so, worse, by the way, just to let you know. Yes, okay. I know. And it's hard to figure out the fat one I think you're going for. But so uh, Shatner, an angry Shatner, yeah. calls in to the show, wants, demands to talk to Seth. Now, we have a writer in this situation. One of the older writers, his name is Danny Smith. We throw him out there because he loves to talk. He loves to talk to celebrities. And he's the one who will do damage control when this right. stuff happens. So he's talked to William Shatner when we did that joke. He talked to Bob Seger when we described Bob Seger's music as it sounds like somebody uh, taking a dump out the window of a moving car. We, that's how we described it. He called in about that because he had given us license to use one of oh, his songs. Okay. And then he was like, what the fuck? Um, excuse me, F-bomb. Not, <laughs> not here for the life gorgeous. But so he had to talk to Jerry Lewis, oh, rest wow. in peace, yeah. when Jerry Lewis called in um, because we wanted to use some piece of footage of him. Uh, so yes, and Seth himself has been confronted by Bradley Cooper. Oh, we ma- we we took him down in a very long monologue where somebody was describing Bradley Cooper to somebody who didn't know him, and it was just a scathing. It's it's like he's he's handsome but not leading man handsome. It's like if you want somebody that you really want your leading actress to shine, you know, it was oh. it was this whole long thing. So it, Seth has had to deal with this. He, we made fun of the size of Adrian Brody's nose. Adrian yeah. Brody confronted uh, Seth somewhere okay. in public. So it happens a lot. Yeah. 
because I, I, we did too many. I think we did a lot of celebrity jokes, and some of them roll with it, and others are like mad for life. But that's the way it is. I know. Did, what did you ever get confronted? Um. Yeah. Let me see. That's a, that's one I'll tell you over dinner because I'm you know I'm so private. I don't want to say the guy's name, but I will say, I'll just, I'll tell you the guy's name later. But um, okay. Um. There. There. Some of the guys I really like. Like one's a really good actor, and and. Yeah. Uh, uh, I won't say this guy's name, but one of his co-stars did the show and she's like, he told me not to do the show, but I'm glad I did the show. This is great. You know, he's on a TV series yeah. and I, he says, uh, you did a joke about him. I said, Oh, I don't remember. He goes, yeah, it was on your first show. And I said, Oh, I better check. Oh. And I checked and you know, I did it. I shouldn't have done it. Now I don't call these people to apologize. It, I think it's making too much out of it. Yeah, and and I just say if I ever run into him, I'll apologize. But of course, I'm never <laughs> running into him. But, yeah, but it was we only had seven writers, and uh, and they were it was on the first show. Where I said we're committed to getting the big guests. We're going to get the Steve Gutenbergs, and then mm -hmm. someone pitched this guy's name, and everyone yeah. laughed. And he wasn't doing much at the time, so I included his name in there. But he's a very big actor, and I'll tell you when we stop hit uh, stop recording. Okay. But I'm um, so I, I regret, I regret that one. And, uh, uh, cause he's, he's very talented, but he, uh, he was a big fan of mine prior to that. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Well, I mean, you had a lot of big fans, uh, coming off sports center in the daily show. You oh. were the, you were, the, you were the it girl. You were the it girl. And yet now I'm just gliding through life. The book is underway. I'm writing small chapters. It's a life on, it's a book on leadership. It's a book on yes. uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, for the young people? For the young people. For I the love it. Uh, trying to think if there's uh, anecdotes. Did I, I did tell you the, you know, the Kevin Costner story, right? <laughs> Uh, no, I, I've heard a few Kevin Costner stories. I don't think I know the one that, uh, well, we that has you in it. So, well, this was just, uh, this was just the late, late show. Oh yes. You, you already know this story cause you were there. You were there. So basically uh, remind uh, me. Okay. So, uh, one of our writers, Wells start was dating a blonde who used to date Costner. Th this is the part I know. Yeah. So I'm getting all the Costner jokes. I'm getting all water world and losing money. <laughs> and then, and then one day it's, uh, one, one show, it's his birthday, so I actually use the – I don't use all the Costner jokes because there are too many. Yeah. And it's, hey, today's Kevin Costner's birthday. He turns 46. His uh, friends threw him a surprise birthday party, and somehow that lost $10 million. <laughs> That's a great joke. Did Wells write that? I assume he did, unless That's it was so Ross. Funny. But, but you know what I'm saying? That's great. That's um, great. Ross punched it up. But so what happened was <laughs> – um, we went, I, we went to dinner that night to the polo lounge and you, I, I invited you. I, th I think you were there and we're having dinner. So it's like seven o'clock. The show doesn't air till 1230 and yeah. Costner walks by and says, Craig, I I'll do your show, man. I promise I'll do your oh, show. God. I didn't even know we were trying to book him. Oh. And I'm just saying, please don't watch the show tonight. So oh, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, Natus could have given you a heads up about that. I Come know. On. I just uh <laughs> I, oh, it's so hotel, funny. Motel I don't, Mike. I don't I I I honestly I don't always like to rehash the old late late show stuff. It was a magical it. time. It was great. But it's uh it's uh, I like talking we didn't, about we, we didn't know what a nice we didn't know that that was the end of the nice era in this country. Like people it through the 90s like to complain, complain, complain Gen X, you know, my generation they, they were we were coming up, we were complaining about this and that and upset about this and that. And looking back, we had nothing to complain about in the nineties. Yeah, it's it's um it's interesting. I was uh I watched the beginning of Rebel Without a Cause the other night, but I was reading the summary and they were talking about it's it's about kids uh, struggling and to grow up and and parents the bad parenting and like yeah. they're acting like back then the world was falling apart <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know it's so like, it's like we, every generation is worse and worse or so they, know. the perception is is that way yep yep um all right so let's move i'm gonna i'm gonna now jump to the life gorgeous quiz this is good this is good because i want to oh, save it. stuff for other for other times that we that were uh Please. i have you on okay Yes, sir. I could talk to you for a long time. So I agree. This is the uh, Life Gorgeous Quiz Simple Questions Profound Insights. Oh, yes. Okay? 
this is easy. I, I just I just find this easy. But you're a music guy. Finish this Rod Stewart song lyric. Oh no! Loosen up that. I don't like Rod Stewart. Oh really? Tonight's the, you know that song. Tonight's the night. Tonight's the night. Loosen up that. Yeah. No. I. I. But what does he say? Ascot. Oh. No, I'll give you a, one of the words. The reason I say this is because as a kid, when I'm in high school and this is out, I'm like, oh, I like the way that sounds. Loosen up that pretty dress. French gown. Oh, see, I knew it was in that area. Uh, I do not love Rod Stewart. Okay, that's okay. I think he's sort of like a haircut and and that's he it. Has a like cool he's not voice. my favorite He, he guy. does have a good voice and he has some good songs, but that's okay. And by yeah. the way, Alec is younger than I am, but somehow he knows a lot of different music from different eras. I don't know how I know, that although is. I failed. I failed at that one. I, that's okay. Yeah, but I, I'm if, just, you, if you want to ask me a lyric from uh, Love Touch, I'll, I'll nail it. What, is, what is Love Touch? What is Rod that? Stewart's Love Touch, that song that was the uh, the theme from that movie Legal Eagles with okay, Robert Redford. Okay, so you're Redford making fun Dan. of him then. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, next question. Who does my brother think is more dynamic on stage, Tom Jones or Elvis? Tom Jones. Correct. Yes. Now, do you think that? No, <laughs> but I know that your brother thinks that. And I know that that would be the only reason for asking that question is because the answer is so absurd. Um, who would you rather have a drink with Mark Zuckerberg or James Spader? James Spader. More fun at a dinner party, Bill Gates or James Spader? <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Spades. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. That was just going yeah. back to our uh, I, yeah, wealth versus it. personality. Or yeah. Do you like Spader as an actor, by the way? I do. I used to love him. I, di I didn't watch uh, The Blacklist. Is that what it's called? Yep. The Blacklist. Blacklist. Yep. I, I didn't watch it, although like people like my dad love it. You mm -hmm. know, they'd, they'd be way into it. But James Spader was a, sort of an under-the-radar great 80s villain. Yeah. He was in in Pretty in Pink. I think he he's he really peaked, and also in Less Than Zero. I mean, he he was just a really fun guy to be, and even his small role in Wall Street, mm -hmm. incredibly memorable, where he has the great line reading when Charlie Sheen is trying to get him involved in his nefarious activities, and and James Spader says. What's in it for moi? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so great. Did you see the, uh, what's it called, Boston Legal with Shatner? Did you see him on that or not? I, I think I saw a few episodes of that. That was still back in the era when I was watching uh, primetime television. His delivery is special. I'll just put it to you that way. His delivery is special. Yep. But I will tell you, there's a movie I didn't see, a little controversial, but uh, Secretary with Maggie Gyllenhaal. Did you see that? You probably did. You I see, did. You see everything. I, I, I try to see a lot. I see less and less these days, but I did see that. Was that was it? good. Yeah. He was great in that. And it was, it was a cool movie. It was a movie that got into something that I'd never seen a movie get into. Yeah. And, uh, and I, and I thought it was highly interesting. Although I, while we're settling on James Spader here. Yes, sir. And not to, we love him, but. Why? Because there, you are a, a kind of James Spader, but you have maintained your James Spader appearance because James Spader used to be one of the most handsome men in Hollywood for sure. He had a full and head. Now, of hair. Yeah, he had a full it, head of it hair. Just, I think it, time ravaged him in a way that it has not touched you. Yeah, I just want to see how old he is to see if. Um, Oh, he's uh, he's sixty three, so he's yeah. a couple years older than I am. But way old, yeah. But I I don't know how that works. I think what happens with some people if they start um, receding hairline, sometimes they just want to shave it off because they they dislike the way it looks with a patch of hair back there. And I would say, yeah, some guys just look cooler uh, with uh, completely bald. And they there's yeah. a I think Yule Brenner opened the door for a lot of people. That's before <laughs> your time. But these guys, oh, look, I know Yule. These guys look cool with a, with a, a shaved head, and yeah. uh, you know the, some of them look sleek. He's uh, not one of them. But anyways, uh, yeah. uh, I don't know if you can do this. Name three Richard Burton movies. Uh, the Lion in Winter. Was he in uh, that one? Was he in that who's, one? 
Uh, not, Maybe not, not. Maybe that's Peter uh, O'Toole. Peter Sorry. O'Toole. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, he's in, uh, of course, Who's Afraid of Virg- uh, uh, Virginia Woolf. Bingo. Love that. And he was in uh, Don't Look Back in Anger. Um, or was it just called Don't Look Back? I think it was called Don't Look Back in Anger. And uh, then he was in that uh, that World War Two movie. Uh, that's a great one. Uh, the, wait. The, oh, hey, the, where the Eagles Dare. Of, where where Eagles, Eagles Dare. Yeah, Clint yeah, Eastwood. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, don't I know love Richard one. Burton. There's uh yeah, he was a tremendous uh Oh, was, you have to you have to see that second one. I don't know if it's called Don't Look Back or Don't Look Back in Anger. It was early Burton. Okay. And he's he's the star and it was an a movement in England. It was something called I believe the the kitchen dramas. They started them because it was a a much more realistic way of movie making. It it really delved into actual issues as opposed to just being like a 1950s movie right it was they were serious they were interesting and he really i think that was the movie that kind of made him um oh no it's called look back in anger 1959 richard burton yes um, excellent excellent movie you'll oh, love it check, i'm gonna i'm gonna check that out it has a decent it. rating. It's a seven. That's not a bad rating. So yeah. I recommend for everybody two, two Richard Burton movies. One is Beckett with Peter O'Toole, and it's I th- and I, a friend of mine says Peter O'Toole is better in Beckett than he is in Lawrence of Arabia. Oh, he's oh screaming most of the movie theatrically, Shakespearean yes. screaming. It's it's sure. it's major. And then the other one with Richard Burton is the spy who came in from the cold. Yes. And that is John Le Carre, uh, based on a, the British crime novelist, John Le Carre. That's black and white, and that's pretty cool. Those are just a couple things. You know I got to check that out. Yeah. I got to check that out. I just watched recently a Peter O'Toole uh, movie from the 80s, my favorite year. How was I'd that? seen it. You know, I'd seen it before, and I liked it when I was younger. And then re watching it, I didn't like it as much. The movie itself was very schmaltzy, but. O'Toole is fantastic. Yeah, he that's plays like an aged yeah. star, yeah. and he was he was kind of perfect at that. There's a little fun piece of trivia in it. It is, um, you know, it takes it's supposed to take place in like the 50s and the golden era of television and Rockefeller Center, and it's supposed to be like a your show of shows kind of parody. And so they have, as they do in a lot of those things, when people are walking around the hallways around the TV show, there are a lot of people uh, extras in costumes walking around. Right. One of them is a girl who's just a giant cigarette box, so you can't see her face. You can just see her legs. And I was reading the trivia about the movie, and the girl who was in the cigarette box was the girl that Phil Spector shot in the mouth oh, and oh killed. My Lord. <laughs> so she had a rough run. Oh, <laughs> she was just gosh. a, a that, cigarette box and then shot by Phil Spector. That is crazy. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that to our attention, Alex. <laughs> That's the, the head writer of Family Guy, ladies and there gentlemen. There he is. Uh, no, you know what bothers me is like guys like Peter O'Toole is amazing, but a lot of the movies are not up to his talent. And that's what bothers totally. me. Well, the, it's interesting because you you talk about that and you could say that with even like a like a Cary Grant or, you know, all the big. Never so I know you Oscar, love Cary Grant. But what movies, you know, he never won an Oscar, but that's the way it is. You know? That's and the Peter, way it is. And Peter O'Toole and Richard Burton, I think they're both nominated. I know Richard Burton was nominated seven times and never won an Oscar. And I sometimes will look up, you know, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? What what actor won that year? I think that year was legit. No, no, that was Beckett. The year that they were both nominated for Beckett, it was Rex Harrison in My Fair Lady. Right. So that was legit. But there's some other ones that, you know. But the, even the, Who's this not, Brando guy, by the way? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> even, even the Rex Harrison thing is not totally legit. Because Rex Harrison is a, a great actor and he's very fun to watch. But My Fair Lady was simply a crowd-pleasing movie. Right. Like, in, in the way Beckett is interesting and probably much more challenging and dynamic right. acting-wise, right. um, My Fair Lady just kind of didn't make anyone think too yeah, much. Yeah, and not to, I'm just going to, I'll promise I'll move off Richard Burton. His voice nope. just throws, it's just like, I can't believe how great his voice is. It's just like listening to his voice is so, it's so dramatic. And just him talking, it's like, 
in a different way, when I interviewed Charlton Heston years ago, his voice, and one of the five questions was, can I just hear you go through a McDonald's drive through and order a Big Mac fries and a shake? And he goes, I'll have a Big Mac I'll have fries. You know? Fries and a shake. That was, some of those five questions were just about, I mean, the Ian McKellen uh, tire instructions oh. was is forever etched in late night history. And but, I'll just, uh, yeah, you, you, you make... Uh, you make great points about uh, Richard Burton is you have to, I think we've talked about this before. If you haven't already, you got to watch the trip with Steve Coogan and Rob Bryden, the British movie where they drive around the English countryside, trying different restaurants because they both do flawless impersonations of Michael, Michael Caine, Caine, Richard Burton. Oh, I got to watch and that. Cause one, I just one saw, of them doesn't, imp- yeah, yeah for, go ahead. For whatever reason this morning over coffee, I was watching, Oh, cause Michael Caine said he's, virtually retired or pretty much so. But I was watching the scene where they were doing uh, Coogan, they were doing Michael Caine. That is so great. No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't do it with the nasal in the voice. But you, they do Richard Burton. And the, the one guy, Rob Bryden, does Richard Burton. He says, have you ever heard Richard Burton conjugating the verb to be? And he was like, no. And he was like, I am. She is. You know, and it goes through it all, all like that, and it's oh, it's so spot on. You'll I, you'll love that. I love that. Here's the last question. I can't remember if I did this with you before, but I hope I hope I haven't. Uh, top three sandwiches of all time. Did I do that with you last time? I don't remember. I don't think so. Okay, good. I don't think it's so. One of my okay, favorite well, questions. All right, so I'm going to start with number one, which is etched in stone for me, is the BLT. Oh, oh nice. People like God, that. Is good BLT, maybe on like a toasted sourdough with some mayo. Oh, just delish. You know, the, now, mayo, the mayo is key because I used to, I had it as a five question. What are the two key ingredients that make a BLT magic? And it's the mayo and the bacon, grease on yeah. grease. Anyways. Absolutely. Love that. Um, I think I would have to go, and I, I go mostly chalk. I'm not that adventurous sandwich wise, although I eat sandwiches almost every day, and I will have one today after we are done recording. I eat uh, on a very Jewish early schedule. When it's like 11.01, I'm like, I could start putting my sandwich together. So I, second sandwich for me is roast beef on rye with just mustard, mayo, and pepper. Oh, love that. No cheese. Love it. No cheese. No, I don't, I don't, yeah. I, I, I will take the cheese, but I don't put it on there myself. I don't need it. Have you ever heard of horseradish cream? Love that. Oh. Love that. Um, and I will do that occasionally as right. well. Although I'm so stuck in my ways that sometimes I just forget to do it. But I love the horseradish on there as well for that kick. So yeah. I do want to say, you mentioned rye. That's one of my favorite breads. I like toasted rye. So when I have some of my sandwiches, I go toasted rye. I also like pumpernickel. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Well, and also is a very important tip for if you're going out to buy a rye. Seeded. Oh. Get it seeded. Seeded. Absolutely. You don't, Absolutely. You gotta gotta yeah. have the seeds in there. And number three, again, this is, I got to go club sandwich. Okay. Three cl- just a club. Give me is this a turkey club. I guess that's what they are. Turkey right? club. Yeah. Turkey club. Give me that. The, the triple decker. I get four pieces. And you know, by by the time you hit the third piece, you're thinking, Am I slowing down? But you always get through that third piece and you get to take a couple bites out of the fourth, so it's not embarrassing. And we should point out that Alec, you're a slender young man. You're not you don't have any weight issues, correct? <laughs> Well, I have I have body my own body perception issues. I, okay. My weight is fine. Right, you're right. My, I feel like uh, you know my weight, and, and to look at me as I'm walking around, you would think like, oh, that's that's just a normal guy, maybe even Alan a slender. Guy. You, look, you remind me of Alan Alda. <laughs> that, I've gotten that. I've gotten that before. Um, but yeah, no. When it, for me, it's like I I describe my body as a British body. So it's like slender, but then when the shirt comes off, it's all out of whack. Like I don't look like I want to look at all. It's like a melted candle. And it's but the, th- the but you're a member of Equinox. I know you go three times a week. <laughs> <laughs> Not Are at you, all. What is a workout for? Do you go hiking up there in Summerland or what? Uh, no, I, I I tweeted once a very long time ago. I said I I, I go to the gym so infrequently. I still call it James. 
Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't work <laughs> out. I, I enjoy walking and I'll put on my headphones. I'll listen to Sirius XM, uh, you know, eighties on eight. If you, if you like around. my body, think I'm sexy. Like, <laughs> there you go. Rock it, rock. That song I, that song I like. Um, it was a joy again, Alec. Always fun to talk to you. I'm proud Thank of you. you. I'm proud of you. Always been proud of you. Thank you for for literally plucking me out of nothingness and giving me a career in Hollywood. You are solely responsible for that. I know John Hotchkiss was there in your ear saying, these aren't jokes. These aren't jokes. But you picked me anyway. You saw something, and I appreciate it. Uh, very. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that's our show. We'll see you next time. And remember, young people, I'm proud of you.